Next news on BBC One is at one o'clock. But Andrew, back to you. Many thanks, Ben. And now, as ever, to the papers. The Sunday Telegraph is a highly political front page there. Number 10 plots a Brexit walkout. Rather oddly, ministers have been briefing business that some, at some point in the summer, possibly in September, Theresa May will walk out of those negotiations. Sounds slightly odd, but nonetheless, very important story down the back here. Justine Greening, the Education Secretary, is asking for an extra billion pounds for schools. That is the public spending story or part of it that I was referring to at the beginning of the programme. The Sunday Times has a disturbing account here alleging that uh, an investigation into a rogue SAS unit who killed civilians is being covered up or is about to be covered up. And again, the austerity story there. We move on. You heard the fishing story. There's the Sunday Express splashing on it. No foreign fishing in our waters. But is that absolutely true? We'll find out later on. The Observer has top Tories revolt against May over public sector cash. This is a big, big theme in today's papers. Um, and then finally, it's a Love Island bloodbath. We'll be talking a great deal about that story later on. No, we won't. That's a lie. I'm sorry. And finally, the Mail on Sunday there. Again, Tory chaos over tuition fees U-turn, it says. And we're going to pick up on that straight away, I think, with Heidi. I'm disappointed we're not talking about Love Island, to be honest. You can talk about Love Island if you like, shame. of course. But um, it's not quite our normal thing on no, this programme, Heidi. indeed. No. No. Um, so the top story around Justin Greening and the funding for schools. So um, a number of us for some time, the funding formula, um, as you know, was out for consultation. And we felt that the, the numbers, the machine just didn't work. And those of us who've been significantly underfunded, my area included, for decades, the funding still isn't there. So great that we're seeing Justine coming out and saying, yes, we need to get some more funding in there for schools. So, and to be clear, the politics of this, you're South Cambridgeshire, but all across the country, there's been a kind of revolt by younger voters against the Conservatives and a sense that it was on issues like school funding but above all tuition fees that um, they were coming out and that therefore the Tories have to change direction. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the funding for schools, um, that isn't just young people, families feel that too. Um, I'm not so sure myself around tuition fees. I think um, the biggest thing, uh, risk for us is that we just start chasing Jeremy Corbyn's policies because I don't think that will do any favours. I'm not sure young voters will find that credible. But, so I'm not convinced about the angle to... But, but also, you if you're going fees. to get an extra billion pounds for schools, mm. as for Northern Ireland and so on and so on, on, then you need to find the money, which might mean raising taxes before too long. Yes, and that is a possibility. I'm also disappointed that we didn't stand firm on the triple lock, taking the triple lock away from pensions, because there wasn't a single pensioner that I talked to that didn't agree once it's explained to them, um, and that would have given us six billion so a year. An explaining time, yeah. yeah. Tim, you're looking s a slightly kind of sceptical expression on your face, if I may say so. Yeah. Are you concerned that the Tories have effectively thrown in the towel on public spending? Well, if no one will defend the Tory record on spending, including including a Tory MP, then I will happily step forward and do it. Uh, that is what they were elected to do in 2010, of course, to get the spending under control. Um, in the next seven years, they did not do what Ireland did. It wasn't a, a race to the bottom. On the contrary, the cuts were fairly slow. They were targeted. There was welfare reform. They also ring-fenced certain departments like health and foreign aid. The idea that they've simply closed down the welfare state for business is just nonsense. What this shows is a collapse of political discipline. Mm. And that is troubling. You cannot have a government with a vacuum at its centre, with a Prime Minister who accepts any demand that comes to her. And one thing I agree with Heidi about, you were very critical about the DUP deal, is it does seem as though that was the beginning. Yeah. When the government sold itself for a billion pounds, when it said, you, here's the money, please keep us in power, I think that opened the floodgates. And if you're going to give a billion pounds to the DUP, then why on earth wouldn't the heads of department come forward and say, OK, well, we'd like it a bit more for teachers or doctors? Absolutely right. Naomi, you've chosen, I think, from page of the Mail on Sunday on the same story. Yeah. It's all over the place, isn't it? But, you know, I disagree. I, I don't think, you know, I think this is cumulative. I think it goes back further. Uh, this money tree you keep talking about, I feel like this generation of voters that is so excited about Jeremy Corbyn here and, uh, you know, in North America that energized the Bernie Sanders campaign, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the, they saw the money tree in 2008 with the financial crisis and they saw trillions uh, of dollars and euros and pounds being marshaled to save the elites, to save the banks. And that's when the, uh, the, the spell mm. of austerity started to break, right? I mean, you can't, 
bail out the rich and have people fail to notice that the schools, uh, there's never money for schools, there's never money for health care. So I think it's been a slow process which began with a rejection of that bailout and a big no around the world, but didn't have the courage to put forward, well, maybe this is what we should spend the money on and this is what our world could look like instead. Um, but also this, this idea that the Tories can just kind of suddenly uh, adopt uh, Labour's policies, what I see happening, and not just in this country, but also in North America and to some extent in France as well, with the support for Mélenchon during, during the election, particularly among young people, is a trust for people who've been saying the same thing for many decades, right, mm. in this era of focus grouped politics. And you've written about this in your new book, which I will come on to in just a second. But before we do, um, Heidi Allen, you are very, very critical of the DUP mm. deal. You said you could barely contain your anger about it. And when I read your speech, I thought, here is somebody who is on the edge of leaving the Conservative Party. Uh, no, I hope I'm on the edge of seeing the Conservative Party come back, the one that I know can and should be there. We have got to change our tone and our language. I think we've been become too inward looking. We've forgotten the purpose, you know, why we're there. And I'm reminded constantly when I talk to my constituents of, of what they're mm. looking for. And they want the Tory party to change as well. And this is pressure from the bottom. You've got the story, I think, of the NHS staff in the yep, Telegraph to talk right. about. Yeah, that this, well, the, in mean, the Observer, I the Observer. This, so this is around um, a book written by a junior doctor about what life's like, which of course feeds on the back of the debate around the pay freeze for nurses in particular. And I had a surgery yesterday. I had um, a doctor come to see me who describes pressures the like of which she has never experienced. And we need to look at supporting all our public services, but the NHS, I think, particularly at the moment, is really, really struggling. So um, whether it's junior doctor contracts, the pay freeze, these people are very, very overworked and we need to look to see what we can do to support them. Now, the biggest fish in the pool of political correspondents, at least physically, is Tim Shipman in the Sunday Times. And he's got an interview with Michael Gove, who's coming on the show in, in, a, in a moment. Yes. Uh, Tim, just tell us a little bit about the interview and what you make of it. Well, uh, of course, we have a whole goldfish bowl of excellent correspondence at the Telegraph, I want to say, but it's of true course. the Times does have an excellent interview with him. This is very important. Gove is back. Politically, that's significant because, of course, he got in so much trouble after the referendum. He was told by Theresa May, go to the backbenches and prove yourself, which he appears to have done. He has come back and he's been given arguably the most important post-Brexit job of all, and that's agriculture. Most important because agriculture in this country is so reliant upon EU subsidies and so many people in agriculture voted for Brexit but they arguably could be the ones most economically hurt by it. And all the government has said is that we're not going to cut subsidies until 2022 but for a farmer yeah. that's not very long ahead. But here he does actually come up with some, he does put some meat on the bone, he does have some serious policies. We know Britain's leaving the London uh, Convention on Fisheries we know that's going to happen. But he also mentions that he might be thinking about a ban on live exports, which is brilliant if you're a fan of animal welfare. And he also hints that there will be a sort of redistribution of the subsidies, that those who simply get them because they have a lot yes. of land will see yes. them cut back, and there'll be a focus instead upon good maintenance of the mm -hmm. land. So it's interesting to see him already fleshing out some ideas. Naomi Klein, we'll talk a little bit about regulation and so forth in the US context. But one of the things that um, people want in this country is a big new free trade deal with the US mm -hmm. and in that context the American farming lobby is very powerful and they have lots of techniques that we don't allow here whether it's chlorine washed chicken or use of mm -hmm. certain hormones in beef and so forth yeah. in those talks how big a say will American farmers have do you think well, you always have to make a distinction uh, between American agribusiness companies who will have a huge say and, and American farmers Wendell who've been Berry, on the other hand. put out of business mm. for a long time mm. uh, because of the extraordinary control of companies like Cargill and Monsanto. Um, but, you know, th this certainly relates to this all-out assault on regulations uh, that the Trump administration is pushing through with all attention uh, focused on uh, the president's tweets uh, and trolling of television anchors and the Russia investigations and so on. Meanwhile, there is this methodical attack on, on, on regulation. So when Britain talks about a, a trade deal which would require a degree of, of, of harmonization with, with the United States, it's important uh, for people here to understand that the bar is being lowered very, mm. very dramatically in areas where it is easy to do so 
particularly the Environmental Protection Agency, so much of what Obama did was through the e executive order, which is the easiest to undo for Trump because he doesn't what, even need what Congress. What people worry about here is whether that will that will be, as it were, imported here in some new yeah, trade deal. There will be a race to the bottom. In, in your book, you talk about political shock being a, a, a deliberate strategy to unsettle people. Just explain to us a little bit about what you mean. Well, there, there has been this strategy uh, in place now for, uh, I w on the right for, for half a century of using de profoundly destabilizing moments, various kinds of shocks where people wake up in a country that feels profoundly different than the one they went to sleep in and understanding that in those moments when people are deeply frightened and disoriented after the 2008 financial crisis, I would argue after the Brexit vote as well, when the ground is shifting. You can uh, use that to ratchet politics in, in one direction or another. Yeah, sometimes it's referred to as a moment of extraordinary politics. But one of the things that's been interesting to me watching British politics from the other side of the Atlantic is it seems that these tactics really aren't working that well. I mean, there was there were all of these trial balloons floated after the Brexit vote about turning the UK into a giant tax haven. And from everything I'm hearing, things that's seem to be not, going in the other direction. That's not the direction we're going. <laughs> right, yeah. can, can I stay with British politics? In that case, Heidi, there's a very interesting story about the Tory whips that's right. um, uh, in the papers yeah. today and they're back to their old tricks. We used to have very, very brutal whipping in the 1970s when there were very small majorities mm. from the Labour Party and you know, kneecaps were broken and people were ferreted out of toilets and forced into the voting lobbies You're on, assuming on that stretchers. stopped now, obviously. You're assuming that stopped now. Well, I, 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 it's certainly <laughs> restarting again, according to, this, according to this story. It's restarting again. Yeah, it's, um, it's really disappointing. A story that suggests that sort of PPSs, the private secretaries that work for the various ministers, are going to be the eyes and ears of the whips and find out what conversations are being held about leadership uh, mm. sort of campaigns. And I, um, I find it worrying and disappointing because, um, for me, the whole way that the Tory party will be what it needs to be and change, which you so desperately need to do, is when we start talking to each other and start trusting each other. Other. It's those whispers in corridors and power games and egos that have got us into this position in the first place, and this has got to stop. So the SW1 stars are not what we need more of, you would say now. <laughs> no. Let, let's keep moving on. Um, we haven't really talked much about the Brexit story in the Sunday Telegraph. Mm -hmm. it's a big story. This is a very, very big story. It turns out that uh, uh, we have got a Downing Street source which briefed business to say that in the course of the negotiations, it's highly likely that the Prime Minister will walk out over the issue of the bill that we pay for the divorce from the EU. Now, if you're going to enter in negotiations, it's unwise to go around in advance briefing people about what you're going to do. It seemed odd to me, it's I must say. It's doubly unwise mm. if you brief them that the walkout will be, quote, for domestic consumption. In other words, this is not really about, in the long run, achieving a reduced divorce bill. This is about sending a message to British voters, who, according to every poll, hate the thought of us paying a huge divorce bill, that the government is hanging tough. And so I'm going to do something theatrical, but don't worry, because I'll tell you about it first. And I yes. don't really mean it. And of course, yeah. if you know who done it in the play, uh, the play <laughs> is much less enjoyable. You don't, you don't going to watch it, <laughs> it rather loses it? its point, doesn't it? So this is this is a huge error, and it speaks to this sense, uh, this extraordinary switch in the fortunes of the government that has gone from being strong and stable, as it famously sold itself in the election, as being the only only party that can negotiate a tough, proper Brexit, to one which appears to uh, just be falling apart on the subject. We're almost out of time. Naomi Campbell, very, very... <laughs> Sorry, I beg your pardon, Naomi Wolf. No, I'm flattered. <laughs> Naomi, Naomi Campbell going. would be great on the sofa too. Keep I hate to add, if she's watching. If she's watching. <laughs> Klein. Um, Naomi Klein, um, we haven't talked about Grenfell, which is the other huge story of the week, of course, carries yeah. on being a big story. Yeah. Just give us the headline that kind of most struck you. from. The oh, well, I think uh, this story uh, about being told to... to bury uh, the, the this fire report about the firefighters who yeah um, who used to be a firefighter and now it seems working for some sort of private company don't tell anyone about the fire risks and I think this relates right. to the you know what's being described as chaos um, but the fact that residents don't trust the people who are supposed to represent them why would they when they're hearing about buried reports and you know I think this is so much about a crisis of democracy more than anything else certainly it's all about trust we've been talking about a lot of trust this morning thanks to all of you very much indeed and so to the weather